Amen. Amen. Everybody have a seat. All right. Let's see here. Take your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 17. I had to figure out what I want to preach this morning. I had three messages picked out. And as I went to each one of them, each one of them looked like it was better than the last until I got to the third one. Then it looked like it was not as good as the first. At any rate. We're back to that one. Acts chapter 27. We uh, finished up our Ezekiel study this morning. And it ends in a city called the Lord is there. Isn't that amazing? Uh, God told Israel, come out of Egypt and uh, I want to meet with you someplace. And he says, I'm going to meet with you there. There's always a there place for God's people. And uh, most people never find it. They're always just the other side of there or just outside of there, but they never get there where God is and they only hear rumors about what God would do. Uh, start next Sunday. I think what we're going to do for a while is uh, I've got a, a, a series of studies that are uh, kind of, uh, I don't want to call them basic because they're a lot deeper than basic, but it deals with uh, essential uh, Bible doctrines, imputation, salvation, redemption, all of the uh, T-I-O-N words that are uh, typically found in the book of Romans and Ephesians. Uh, also with the, uh, the uh, seven New Testament mysteries uh, that will be found uh, only in uh, Pauline epistles and uh, one in, uh, in, uh, by John. Uh, these are things that people don't know anything about. Also uh, will include in this, this group of studies a, a study on dispensations and how in the world people get so fouled up as to think the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same when God is not heaven and heaven is not God. Heaven is where God lives uh, and what he's uh, desiring to make on earth when Christ shows up and God is always God. But since they uh, muddle up everything, they do away with that. And then uh, included in all of those things will be rightly dividing because that's the only way you can possibly get to the, uh, to the right conclusions on each one of those things. Uh, but this morning, I want to preach a message from the book of Acts chapter 27. I'm going to read a little bit here. And this is, a, uh, this is not a doctrinal uh, message so much. I, I, I just can't even get my mind focused on the on doctrinal things quite so much after just getting so incensed by all of the nonsensical things that are going on. But it's a very practical message. It's, it, it's entitled, When You Believe the Wrong Things. You don't meet people that don't believe things. And you don't meet people that are not strong in their faith. The problem is most people believe the wrong things and it steers them in entirely the wrong direction. So in Acts chapter 27, uh, let's see here. Let's start reading. Well, let's start reading in verse 1. And if you can bear with me, read along with me. And if I miss a word because I'm in a hurry, uh, you'll know what it is. I'm not trying to shortchange you by any. Uh, I just missed it. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. Paul had been arrested for preaching. It's kind of interesting in, uh, in Acts 22 uh, there's an entire chapter where Paul preaches in Hebrew. And yet there's not a Hebrew manuscript on the face of the planet for that. It's translated into Greek and then into English. So when people are, well, you've got to have the original manuscripts. There aren't any. Isn't that interesting? But you do have the faithfully preserved copy of what God wanted you to know that will endure to all generations forever found in a King James Bible. So anyway, he's been arrested. He's being hauled off to Rome. He uh, had a trial with uh, uh, local governors and so forth. And uh, they'd almost been convinced to get saved, but they're like a lot of other people. Almost is still altogether lost and almost is still, the, still a heathen and not a Christian. So uh, verse two, and he entered into a ship of Adriamatum we launched meeting to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. The next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends to refresh himself. He's a, uh, a trustee, so he's allowed to go around by himself. Uh, isn't it amazing that you could be on your way to Rome to be killed, but you had such a testimony among even your captors that they trusted you to come back? 
You can't find preachers with that level of testimony anymore. They can't be trusted with anything. You can't find Christians as their word is much, worth much anymore. They say one thing and do something else. They swear up and down uh, on a stack of NIVs. They want to get right with God and then won't. But it takes at some point just the idea, I'm willing to die for what's true and what's right. But if you believe the wrong things, you can't ever figure out what that is. And it leaves you in a very serious uh, situation. All right, verse 4. Uh, and when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there, certain, uh, uh, there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. Uh, when you find something heading to Alexandria or from Alexandria, Egypt, you know that's a bad place because God called his son out of Egypt. He called his people out of Egypt and he called everything out of Egypt. And the Egypt is a type of the world that bears no resemblance to anything good. And every manuscript for every modern Bible version that you find is from Alexandria by way of the Gnostic heretics that live there. But they were intelligent men. Just what they believed was wrong. Verse 7 and when we had sailed slowly many days and scarcely were come over against Sinaitis, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete and over again against Salomon. And hardly passing, it came into a place uh, which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto is the city of Lassa. Now when we had spent much time, uh, now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and with much damage, not only of the lading of the ship and ship, but also of our own lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to, uh, de advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice, and from there to winter, which is in which is in the haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and the northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosening thence, they sailed by Crete. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank you that uh, we have a book in our hands. And I don't refer to just any book, but a King James Bible that is able to show us the wisdom and the will of the living God. It is able to direct our, us in the paths of salvation. It is able to uh, correct us on any uh, and every subject that uh, will come to mind or to hand. And it is able to guide us to the, to the glorious city of the living God that we read about this morning in safety. Lord, there's not another way to get there and there's not another book that has the integrity of this one having been preserved by the living God. And we pray this morning uh, that you'd bless the preaching of your word, bless the uh, visitors that we have with us today, bless our young folks as they uh, endure the uh, tribulations and trials of this world. I pray, God, that you'd inoculate them with your Holy Spirit and the uh, understanding of your word to help them to resist the, uh, the nonsensical claims of this world and to believe the truth. Uh, Lord, lest they should fall into the uh, slew of uh, lies and falsehoods that this world sells. Now, God, we just ask you to have your way in our hearts and our lives. Bless every track that was passed out uh, last week and at Mystic uh, Saturday. And uh, God, every uh, eye that read and fell upon those signs that we hold, that God, you'd speak to them about their soul's need of a Savior and our God. Lord, we just thank you today. Bless and lift up those that are sick. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so in the, in, in the book of Acts, what we find is Paul is on his way to Rome. Uh, he understands that he's been called as the apostle to the Gentile to give testimony to governors and to kings. And I suspect that he realizes where this is all going to end. It is not going to end in a... Uh, a logical uh, evangelistic rally somewhere. It is going to end with him uh, with his head in a basket as he uh, testifies of the saving knowledge and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I want to be careful. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, 27, Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth thee to err the words of knowledge. 
everywhere that young people go and everywhere that older people go, they hear counsel from people they, they assume have some level of understanding or wisdom, and it's all counsel against God. If you're willing to spend $150 an hour to go lay on a nice leather couch and tell some uh, guy with a notepad what your problems are and how your mother mistreated you and your father didn't love you and give you the bicycle you wanted, uh, He's going to give you counsel and listen to you and ask you what you think about that. The problem is, is you don't think anything about it or you wouldn't have those problems. You wouldn't account that all of sin and come short of the glory of God. You've just got problems. You need to grow up, pull your pants up, tighten your belt and move on. You're going to think that it has to be somebody's fault while you're having troubles in life. Well, there's, a, there's always an element of that to life. If it wasn't for Adam, none of us would be in sin today. If it, if it wasn't for Eve's uh, willingness to listen to the devil, we wouldn't have other, other uh, issues going on in Bible versions. And, uh, and the, the whole idea of reconciling my opinion with what God said. But having said that, we have to come to a point where we accept as fact something. Your life must be built on something that has a permanence, that has an absoluteness to it, or you'll just be like the, uh, the leaves out there blowing this way for a while, and when the wind changes, blowing the other way until they ultimately decay from being beat around in the woods. When uh, King, King uh, Solomon died, he was granted by God wisdom in an extraordinary fashion, more wisdom than any man that had ever lived. Probably any man that ever lived since then saved the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. He had more wisdom than them. But you know what his wisdom failed at? He couldn't take his own advice. He, he knew what was right. He knew what, what following strange women, read through Proverbs, man. He knew what the, the Egyptian women were all about. He knew what the, the, the bed clothes and the tapestries and all the, the luxurious surroundings were. He knew what could happen all those things, and he did it anyway. This idea of, oh, I'm just going to live this experimental life. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not really a great idea. You know, they, they say the, the, the worst thing that you can hear in Arkansas is uh, just before a great disaster is, hey, y'all, watch this. <laughs> You've got to learn by people's, other people's mistakes. You don't need to keep remaking them. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, came along, and his problem was he was uh, youth-oriented. Isn't that how they say it? Everything was for the kids. The old man that had built his father's kingdom and given his father the counsel to make silver as dust in the streets for wealth and prosperity, given him power over the nations, well, I think I'll just listen to the younger guys and tell me they be just be tough on them, hammer them down. That'll that'll fix them. You know what it was? He he believed some things. He took advice, but he believed the wrong things and took the wrong advice from the wrong people. And God, before he even got a foothold on life, took his kingdom away, and it never recovered. To this very day, it's waiting the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to regather those 12 tribes and put them back together while the rest of the world tries to pretend like they're one of them. One of these decisions leads to another. Anybody in here ever make a bad decision? And if you don't correct that decision, I'll guarantee you, you'll make another one following it up. And at some point, you just got to stop and say, whoa, I, I'm tired of this. What's the right thing to do? And what you usually find is it leads you all the way back to where you made that first bad one and you start over again. First bad decision is not to accept Christ as Savior. You know, the Bible says that uh, you must be born again. Today we have people, well, I have my own religion. So does the devil. And you better be careful because the one you have might be his. The second one is, well, our church doesn't teach that. Well, does your church teach the Bible? your church teach the truth, how would you even know? The average professing Christian that doesn't have a Bible, doesn't carry one, doesn't read it, and is unwilling to put the time in to study it to find out what the truth of anything is. So it all becomes a matter of opinions. And like a good friend of mine told me one time, he was, he was crippled. He, uh, he uh, grew up, uh, I was, I'm originally from Florida, uh, my mother was a rainbow chaser. We ended up in Wichita and California, all over the place. And uh, when I was in Wichita, I didn't know Rex Harrison then, but he, he was from the same town I was from a couple blocks over. He grew up there. He had polio. Back in the, uh, the 50s and the 60s, you know, back in that other century back there. 
That was a very common thing back there. And he said, uh, he says, well, I'll tell you something. He had that draw, kind of a Midwestern draw. Well, I'll tell you something. He says, uh, opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got them and they all stink. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a pretty graphic way to describe it, but if your opinions don't match God's, in which case there are facts, they stink. And you'll be believing the wrong things because it's doing what you want to do. Most people's a level of, of fact searching doesn't rise higher than their own. I like that. In verse, let, me, let me get to our message here. In verses 10 and 11, Paul, well, verse 9, Paul admonished them in verse 10 and 11. He says, uh, hey, guys, and he says this very respectfully. He says, uh, this is not a good time to go. I'm going to paraphrase it now, because if we go, the ship's going to lose its cargo, and there's going to be a hurt to an awful lot of people here. And you know what they said? Shut up, preacher. What do you know? You don't know nothing about that. So stick to your books. Stick your back. Keep your nose in the, in the Bible there. You don't know nothing about sailing around. You don't know anything about rough weather. You don't know anything about living out on the ocean. I'll tell you one thing he knew. He knew the Lord. And the Lord's the one that makes the weather. And the Lord's the one that sets the course on the seas. And the, one, uh, the Lord is the one that either brings you into that safe haven that's spoken of in Psalms and over in, uh, in, uh, in the Gospels, or you don't. So you'd better listen when he says something. And when God's people and God's prophet says something, the world might better sit up and take notice because they just could well be right. You've got to take what they said, compare it to the scripture. They didn't want to do that. They just wanted to do what their experience and what the old seamen, you know, the, the men of the sea had said. Yeah, they, those guys know everything. They've been out on the, the water their whole life. Did you ever wonder what Jonah knew about fish? <laughs> I bet he knew more when he finally landed on shore than he did when he went. But he learned it the hard way, didn't he? When you believe the wrong things, folks, you're setting yourself up for disaster. That's a simple, if you leave early, you're not going to miss anything. You're setting yourself up for disaster. So as, as this goes along there, here's the voices that people are listening to. They're listening to the voice of the press. Well, you know, that Bible will make you crazy. If you read that Bible, you know, you'll, you'll just be a homophobic bigot. Really? I don't, I don't think most people are doing that bad a job of those things without reading the Bible. And the Bible says God made a one, uh, of all men, uh, of one flesh, all men. So that tells me that, uh, listen, there's nobody better than others. Might be somebody smarter or might be somebody uh, more talented or gifted in some way. They're not better people. You know what the great leveler is? It's that we're all equal. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all start out needing to look up to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and trust Him. And then He can raise you up. So, well, now you think you're better than me. No, 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 no. I don't think I'm better than you. I think I'm a lot better off than you if you're, sa if you're not saved. If you're lost, I'm going to tell you what, I feel sorry for you because you're going to find out what a devil's hell is all about sooner or later. You don't have to be 80 years old to find out. A lot of young people find out. As a matter of fact, about, uh, what was it, 30, 40,000 of them last year found out what it's like to die of drug overdoses. Why in the world would you do that? You've got to be completely without hope. You've got to be completely lost, from, uh, devoid from reality, thinking, well, everybody else can get overdose, but not me. Man, I'm special. And it doesn't fix a single problem you've got. It makes them all worse. You can believe that it will, but you'll still be wrong. The press today, the liberal press of our day, spews out venom, deception, lies, falsehoods. When it's called the false press, the fake news media, uh, that's not an exaggeration. And I don't think the conservative press is a, is a whole lot better in most regards than those things. They don't spit it out. If you read most... Uh, uh, newsletters put out by churches. They're not any more honest than the, than the Washington Post. You know what they say? Oh, there's a guy in Texas. He said, well, in the, in the last 10 years, we have a church of 1,200 people. I say, wow, I'd love to have 1,200 people. Yeah, I would too. That'd be great. We have a church of 1,200 people. 
uh, last 10 years, we've led 26,000 people to Christ. Really? You mean you only got a tenth of all of the people you led to Christ? That's not a particularly great measure. Where are they? Well, you know, they didn't lead them to Christ. They just got them to say some kind of prayer. Those people weren't converted. They didn't get convinced of anything. But you can send out a newsletter. You can send out a prayer letter. And all of a sudden, wow, that guy must be great. I got to have him in to preach for me. You find out what you get in salesmen, hucksters, advertising gimmicks. But you're not getting the Word of God. You're not getting any power from the pulpit. You're not getting any power from God. What you're getting is something that you think is going to just benefit you. All that is is just a rather hedonistic reach out to uh, make my life better. Well, listen, I'm all for making your life better. Get close to God. You'd be amazed at how good it can get. The press. There's a steady stream of Bible hatred. Bible diminishing. You know, no matter how many scientists give up evolution and trust uh, uh, the creation uh, pattern that the Bible uh, portrays, the press will never be different. Say, why is it? If you don't believe you're accountable to God, who does hold you accountable? Nobody. The early, uh, the early uh, uh, colonial uh, governments if you didn't push, uh, swear to believe that there was a God that held everyone accountable for their decisions and actions in this life, you are not allowed to serve on jury duty. That's amazing. If you believe there's a God that holds you accountable today, you wouldn't be allowed to be a judge. We've just made, we've, we've turned everything on its head. Amazing, the news media has a lot of hold. There is no value neutral. You're either right or wrong. There are consequences for your actions. You know what they think? Well, the newspapers are too big to fail. You know what? If, if America's Christians ever took serious the Bible, it wouldn't take us two years to turn this country around with a revival that would make uh, uh, the make... Uh, uh, Jonas and Nineveh looked like those guys were slacking off because the, the newspapers wouldn't sell anything. Nobody would be watching the television. Nobody would be going to the movies. They'd have to do something moral and righteous or just give up and get a shovel and go dig ditches somewhere. But as long as America's Christians are just so lackadaisical and Laodicean, they'll keep the, they'll keep the coffers turning. They'll keep the, the banks filled. They'll keep it all going. The spin of politicians today. Man, uh, I, I, I see people. And listen, you think about this how you want. I, I don't have the time to give you all the, the nuances of why I think Donald Trump is the best president we've had in probably 50 years. Maybe, maybe longer. He's not for murdering babies. Any other questions? Every other one says it's okay. Listen, if you want to vote for a baby murdering politician, they're not going to think anything more of you. You know what they did? They've dehumanized infants just the same way Hitler dehumanized the, the, uh, the, uh, the Jews and the same way that the uh, Russians dehumanized Christians. We live in an insane world. Well, you can't say anything like that. Everybody gets uneasy. They ought to get uneasy. They ought to be sweating bullets. God's going to hold you accountable someday. Find out what the truth is. I'm glad the elections are over and we don't have to listen to all the lies. Well, <laughs> unless you watch the news, read a paper, read a magazine, or turn the radio on, or read billboards, or buy books. <laughs> Pretty much covers it, doesn't it? You know, the old saw is, you know when a politician's lying, don't you? When his lips are moving. Still true. Listen, I think Donald Trump has done more for religious freedoms in America, more for American Christians than Jimmy Carter ever even dreamed of doing, more than Ronald Reagan ever did. And you know what he's called? Hitler. Well, I, I'm not sure how that computes, except unless you're just lying and you're depending on a bunch of other stupid people just following along there. I don't want to get political on this, but these are easily uh, analyzed observations, aren't they? You don't have to study a whole lot to see these things. These, these politicians 
Uh, every bill that's ever been passed in America for the last hundred years is almost exactly the opposite of what it says it is. I, whatever its label is, you can bet it's going to accomplish just the opposite. Deception. Sinful people. So many people believe the, the information they're given. The Bible says the simple believeth all things and pass on and are punished. God says, you, you, you better study. You might know what that word study means. Put some effort into it. By the way, see this book here? I keep talking about this, and I think a lot of people think I'm just blowing smoke. This King James Bible, there's one word used in that book that is not found in another book that professes to be a Bible on the face of this planet. Anybody want to take a guess what that one word is? Study. Isn't that amazing? Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And it's taken out. Every single one. Sinful people, they change God's word without a blink of an eye. The Bible says the prudent foreseeth evil and are safe, hideth himself and are safe. I'm going to tell you what, you're not going to hide yourself in a, in a hold you make to get through the tribulation, whether you're Mormon or not. You're not going to hide yourself in some kingdom hall and thinking you're going to go into the, the millennial reign and uh, live as kings. You're not. You're going to hide yourself in Jesus Christ to miss the storm coming that's going to take away sinful people. Or you're not. Silly preachers. A lot of people listen to silly preachers. Everywhere you look today, there's a preacher. Joyce Myers. Well, you know, I just, I was in a church. They wouldn't let women preach. I didn't, I just left. I went, didn't, I went, did that. Well, now she's filthy rich off a of sucker's money. She's living in mansions coast to coast. She's got a little puppy dog husband that follows her around and handles the cash. So, well, what about the other? Well, there's uh, some of them teach you how to talk in tongues. There's the people that'll get on there and tell you, anybody ever look at Kenneth Copeland? Anybody know who he is? If that guy's not demon possessed, the devil must be uh, must have gotten saved. That that guy's well, you're gods. I, I can't even make myself look as crazy as that guy looks on a, on his good days. You're you're God. God is God, but you're a little God. You can just say things and they come into being. Sound like more of uh, Norman Vincent Peale, power of positive thinking. Certainly not Bible. And yet the guy flies around in a $100 million airplane, financed by suckers, coast to coast. Listen, you could, yeah, yeah, Joel Osteen, the largest church in the world, if you put church with a small c. Doesn't teach any Bible. Tells everybody they're okay. Tells you your best life is now when the Bible says that you ought to pick up a cross daily and follow Jesus Christ or you're not worthy to be his disciples. But that guy lies through his teeth. He's asked on public television, boy, well, I wish they'd asked me to come on some famous TV show and, and say, do you think there's another way to heaven or is this Jesus the only way? Oh, gee, uh, I'm not really too sure about that. Uh, what, what should I say to get money? Said, well, he didn't say it. I heard him say it. Saw it with my own eyes. Well, I don't know. I just never studied that out. I bet he hasn't. No, I bet he has. He's just a liar. They, they don't care what the truth is. Silly preachers. You know what they're after? Them. Make me big. Make me famous. Be a big deal. Uh, there's another guy, John Hagee. I was watching uh, Mark Levin the other night. I always gave that guy credit for more sense than that. He, he's got John Hagee on there. John Hagee is a loon. He says that the Jews don't need to be witnessed to today because they're the people of God. Does it occur to him that all of Jesus' early disciples had to be converted? Every one of them needed to be born again or they're going to die and go to hell? You know why he does that? He gets all kinds of preferments in Israel for his tours, for his speaking engagements, for all of this stuff, if he just doesn't proselytize the Jews. You know, an old preacher I heard him say one time, and boy, it made more sense about anything else you could hear. He says, if it don't make any sense, there's a buck in it. 
A lot of truth in that. Silly preachers. The Bible says these silly preachers are dumb dogs in Isaiah 56, 10 and 12. They can't bark. Anybody here have a watchdog? That's, that's what the preacher is supposed to be. It's supposed to be the watchman on, in type there on the wall. We just spent 81 weeks in the book of Ezekiel. 81 weeks. You know what he said in there? He says, if you stand on that wall as a watchman and when you see the enemy and you don't tell them, every blood that's shed is on your head. I'm going to tell you something that's a, not a secret. Every Christian that knows Christ as Savior and doesn't witness the blood of your family and your friends is on your head. I don't like that preacher. He just doesn't make me feel good. You would if you did right. Guilty conscience never feels good. It just excuses, alibis, and blames somebody else. Let me give you five things that will happen if you listen to silly people. By the way, if you've never read Acts 27, you may know how it ends. It ends with that ship being torn in pieces. They, they're, they're trying to get off, and Paul says, you, you go anywhere, you're dead. You're dead meat. God says everybody that stays on the ship is going to survive, although the ship's going to be destroyed. And everything. Oh, how can that be? You don't have to understand what God tells you. You just need to do it. That's what faith is all about. There's a couple of guys, they're, they're down there on the lifeboat. They're going to sneak off. They see an island there, we're going to sneak away. Paul says, you get off the boat, you're dead duck. They cut the thing off and let it go. They took all the cargo out, threw it away. Isn't that what he told them? All the lading of the ship's going to be lost? What did he know? Just a preacher. You know what he believed? He believed God had the answer to his problems. He believed God could solve the solutions that they were in. Even that heading in a bad direction, God could get them there safely if they just listened to him. And as that ship finds a place to head to the, to the shoreline, the front of it's stuck in the, in, the, in the shore, and the back of it is just beaten to pieces. And it says some of them made it in there swimming, some of them made it on pieces of the ship. But you know what the secret is? They all made it. You know what the secret to being a Christian is? Stay with the Lord. Stay in church. Stay learning. Stay faithful. Because it might get there, the church might get there a little battered and beaten. But everybody in it's going to get there. And you ain't getting there without him. Five things that will happen to you if you believe the wrong things. Look down here in verse 13. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing... Isn't that where you go sour? Well, it seems to me you start this supposition game. Did you ever notice that all of your supposition lean in your favor? Everything you think and it seems like is always in your favor. But it doesn't work out that way. Supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosing this, they sailed by decree. When you begin presuming that what's going to happen is the way you want it to be, you're well nigh finished. Because once you head out on that course, you read that story, they're driven for two weeks in the sea. They couldn't turn around. There's no way back. There's no answer but to just ride this thing to the shore. However it ends up, that's the way it's going to be. You know, a lot of people, I, I, I can think of some very close to me. Their lives are just an absolute mess. Well, I'm doing right, and look what happened. We did right yesterday. After 25 or 30 years of doing whatever you felt like doing, and you think God's going to sweep away all that stuff and make it good for you. Paul had done right ever since he got saved. Is it going to be easy for him? No, I don't think so. It's going to be a rough way to go. You lose your discernment. You know why people lose their discernment because discernment comes about by accepting absolutes and knowing truth if you if you're one of these people that says well you know truth is relevant or relative not relevant relative or if you're one of these people that say well that's your truth and they have their truth you're never going to arrive at truth because truth ultimately becomes oh here's what i like 
And it doesn't matter at all, does it? That's Sister Eve. Well, it looks like it'd be good for this, and it seems like it'd be that okay. And boy, it must be like that. She directly refuted what God told her. She rationalized away every word God had spoken. Once discernment's gone, all that's left is your preference. Billy Graham used to go to these big rallies, and at the end of it, they always say, I go back to go find the church of your choice. Let me think for a second here. If you've been in a church for your whole life and still lost, why in the world would you go back to that church? If you've been a Catholic all your life and thought you could get to heaven by eating cookies and drinking liquor, how in the world would you go back there after receiving Christ as Savior? That's the worst piece of advice you could get. You know what it should be? Find a church that teaches the Bible. Find a preacher that believes the Bible. Find somebody that's willing to stake their entire lives on the truthfulness of the words of God. And as long as they're following Christ, follow, follow them and help them. Well, just go back to the church of your choice. That's Eve. That's Eve. Bad choice. No discernment in that. Somebody asked Bill Graham one time what heaven was like. This after he wrote a book on heaven. <laughs> and he said, well, I really don't know much about it. The Bible says, I have not seen or ear, ear not heard the things that God prepared for them that love him. And I'm waiting, waiting. You know what the next verse says? You won't believe it. It says, but God will reveal them unto us by his spirit. How could a man that, that believe, preaches the gospel professes to believe in a place called heaven that you can go there by faith in Christ tell you, well, you don't know anything about it. And then write a book about it. Well, if you read the book, you'd realize he didn't know anything about it. Why well, are you picking on him? I'm only picking on him because people with no discernment think he's a great preacher. He preached the great gospel, but with nothing else attached. No discernment whatsoever on any level. Once you lose your discernment, you're going to be uh, cast about by every wind of doctrine. You're inviting bad circumstances. Those circumstances are brought about by the decisions that you make. You know, the Bible says, uh, uh, whether it be good to serve God or whether it be evil, you decide. But it's for me and my house, Joshua says, we're going to serve the Lord. You find people all over America today trying to serve the Lord, having no idea what he said about anything. How do, how do you come to a crazy conclusion like that? We, we live as Christians a supernatural life by revelation. You, you can't figure that out naturally. It does not come naturally. It's something you need to put your, your uh, attendance to, to the Word of God, to the preaching of that Word, to the Holy Spirit, and respond. But people don't do that today. They just find the church that they like. If it's big, got a rock and roll band, Preacher wears skinny jeans and he's cool looking. And I mean, after all, what more could there be? Bad decisions came with their choice to leave safe port. You know why they left? Look at this. Uh, verse 12, chapter 27, verse 12. And because the haven was not commodious to enter in. Anybody know what commodious means? It isn't that seat in the, in the bathroom. <laughs> it's not comfortable. I, I just, I'm not comfortable with this. I just don't find it comfortable. I just don't, that preacher is just so, so outspoken. I just don't, I'm not comfortable around people that talk like that. You're not going to be comfortable around God either. When he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Why would a Christian want to even think about things like that? Don't invite bad circumstances. I've had a few people over the years counsel. We had a, one couple of nice folks, young man, young woman. They, one of them, I think the young man came in first. A couple of weeks later, brought his, this girl with him. And uh, 
somebody told me after two or three weeks, did you know they're living together? I said, no, <laughs> didn't know that. They'd both made a profession of being saved and wanting to get baptized, want to do this, want to do that. Really, I better go talk to them. I went and talked to them and we, we sat down. They were sincere people, nice, nice folks. And I said, look, here, here's the thing. Why don't you get married? If, if that's what you want to do, get married. That's not my counsel, but that would resolve that fornication issue. I said, other than that, what you need to decide on is, is this. Do I love fornication more than I love the Lord? And I could see the look on their faces. Oh, you say, how dare you talk to people like that? How dare they not respond to God's word in it? The, the guy, to his, to his credit and honesty, I mean, he's sad, but honest. After a couple of minutes of just stone silence, he said, I, I guess we just love fornication more than God. Okay, that was that. So did you throw them out of church? Didn't have to. They had sense enough not to come back. All they got to do is just... Not that. All they do is get married. I mean, the options are wide open. A bad decision isn't my fault. When they make a bad decision, I'm not going to take credit for that. I gave them the right answer. If you're sinning, stop it. If you know what's wrong, don't do it. If you know what's right, do it. It's not complicated. Number three. You yield the control of your life to the devil. These people are unav unable to navigate. They, you know what they lost in that ship? They lost their rudder. Waves tore it off. You can't turn when you want. You can't do what you think. You know what, you know what young people think? Let me, let me address Nate and these youngsters here. What you think if you're normal... I'm young. I got plenty of time. I, I can do this. I can do that. And then I can kind of straighten my life out later. Maybe not. You'd like to think that, but maybe not. I've seen people get in such a rut. Yeah, well, I can't now. Look at this. Look at that. I got responsibilities and I got this. And I made a, I married an unsaved guy or I married an unsaved woman and don't yield the control of your life to the devil. The Bible says, yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Allow God to direct you. Allow God to be the navigator. Allow God to, to take you where he wants you to go. He's not your enemy. He's the best friend you'll ever have. They threw, uh, the thing, the, the situation was so perilous, anything that could have helped them, they had to get rid of it or they would die immediately. So they're only prolonging the inevitable. They take all the tackling, all the ropes, the sails, throw it all overboard. Now what? You're just at the mercy of whatever happens. Don't put your life in that situation. Well, I just don't know what to do. Sit tight. Be in church when the Bible's open. Open it at home. Study it. When they lost control of the ship, everybody on there is going the same place they are. You don't ever take, take a bad trip by yourself. One man, God reveals to one man, Paul, what's going to happen to that ship. Paul tells everybody on that boat, this is what it is. preacher. He just don't want to go to Rome. He, don't, he knows he's going to be judged and, and condemned and killed. He just don't want to go. He'd do anything to stall it. You know, there are preachers that would say something for your good when it isn't for theirs. When you believe the wrong things, disaster is inevitable. All direction disappears. The sun went out. The lights went out. They're in the dark. And if they'd had it, they couldn't have done a thing about it. 
I see people every now and then, they just get so frustrated with life and so entangled with their own deceit, their own self-deceit usually is the biggest problem. Their own web of uh, conspiracies of crazy little things they got going on, not necessarily real bad, but just a lot of them. What do I, what do, I do? Well, get saved and come to church and learn what the Bible says. That doesn't sound like an answer to them. No, I mean, what do I do right this minute? Well, I'm going to tell you something. You're only alive right this minute. So whatever decision you make right now is going to determine the rest of your life. Oh, pray God. What about tomorrow? Tomorrow will have its own minute. And whatever decisions you make there, I'm going to steer you in some course. You better make sure what it is. When you lose your discernment, the circumstances go sour, the control of your life is out of your hands, out of God's hands even. He says, if that's what you wanted, that's where you're going to go. Your direction disappears. You know, one of the things a faithful Christian learns, one of the best verses in the Bible, it's uh, Hebrews 13, 5. It says, Hath he not said, I will... Uh, it says, I will not fear what man shall do unto me, for hath he not said, I will never, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Well, what's so good about that? Do you think you're so wonderful and so lovable, Lord just doesn't look at you ever and says, <laughs> What do you do? What do you think? What do you say that for? No. But he said, I've promised. I'll be with you. I will lead you. I will guide you into all truth. Most people, most Christians never study the Bible, never get in deep enough to understand God actually has a plan to deliver you safely to heaven's shores, to deliver you as a useful, living, breathing Christian, sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, how, how are you going to live if you do that? God can make a way. Isn't that crazy? Well, well, well if I, you know, you got to work, got to make a living. Well, if you got to make a living as something God can't bless, how do you think that's going to work? Once your direction's gone, once you've lost your control, the ability to change is almost out of the picture. You know what you're going to be then? You're going to be exactly what this world wants to make you. Oh, I'm a victim. It's, it's their fault. It's because of them. It's because of them. It's, well, how about that? And if, boy, if the government was better, and if, and if I got paid a minimum wage, and if we had socialism, and if Bernie was elected, and if, and if, if we had an Indian princess as our, our president, then well, what does that mean to you? Do you think any of those would solve one problem you have? Well, no, but it sure makes good excuses, doesn't it? I've, I've got, I bet, four sermons I wrote on excuses. I never preach one of them. <laughs> hey, why? Because that's, that's most people's entire life is summed up in an excuse. Why aren't you in church? Well, why don't you read your Bible? Well, why don't you come down and preach on the street with us? Why don't you pass up? Well, Heaven is not going to be made up of excuses. Heaven's going to be made up of the overcomers who by faith in Jesus Christ have done something. It may have only been getting gotten saved and then lived a life that would please the Lord to some degree. I'm not saying you got saved by that, but that's surely what he saved you for. You know what you think? Surely the next time they'll listen. Or maybe it's even closer than that. Maybe you think, well, next time that preacher says something, I'm going to listen. Make it personal. Wouldn't it be something if that was so? <laughs> look, look what happens here. Verse 21. But after a long absence, they, they've been in this thing for two weeks now. No sunlight, wind, rain. Everything blowing over, throwing everything over the side of the ship. All they're just is a bare hull floating around in the, the Adriatic Ocean, just getting beat up. 
But after a long absence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should, not, <laughs> you should have hearkened unto me. Isn't that the thing you want to hear least of all? I told you so. I was talking to my son the other night. He said, I know what you're going to say. Then I've done my job well. You know what's right. Because I didn't have to say anything else. I told you so. Anyway, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Yeah, right. For there shall be no uh, loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Isn't that amazing? That's not a Calvinistic uh, predetermined outcome there. That's God looking over that particular instance and says, if you do what I tell you, I'll get you through. You believe on Jesus Christ, you get to heaven. If you don't, I'm not going to save you against your will. I'm not going to take you to heaven if you don't want to go. Verse 23, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all these men that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. You know what the difference is between Paul and these other guys? They believe their experience. They believe the men that are there. They'd rather listen to men than God. They'd rather listen to men than preachers. What does that preacher know about anything? If he knows what God says, he's sure got an inside run on everything. That it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. Uh, and when the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they go a little further, they sounded again, found it 15 fathoms. Boy, uh, Mark Twain... How deep's the water? It's getting shallower. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. That ain't a time for wishing. You know what the difference is between a wish and a prayer? Wishing is you get what you want. Prayer is letting it in God's hands that he get what he wants out of it. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they set, let down the, the boat into the sea uh, under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the ship, they're fakers. A lot of fakers today. Oh, preacher, well, that's a great message. Oh, you're going to do that? No. Are you going to apply that? No, no, no. I'm not going to apply that by any means. But I just got to tell you that. Sounds good. Paul said, verse 31, to the centurion, to the soldiers, except these that abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Isn't it amazing? You know what they learned? In verse 37 it says, And we were all, in all in all, all the ship, 203 score and 16 souls. Wow. Verse 40, And when they'd taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosed the rudder bands, hoisted up the mainsail of the sea and made toward shore. And falling into the sea where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground. The fore part stuck in fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoner, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, you know what that guy learned? That guy saved our life. That guy's got an inside straight with God. God talks to that guy and tells him what the answers are, how to solve our problems. We better keep that guy around. He might be good to have. Willing to say, Paul kept them uh, from their purpose and commanded they should, which, uh, which could swim, should uh, cast themselves first into the sea and go to the land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. So it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Isn't that amazing? Anybody remember what Paul, uh, some of Pilate's last words to Jesus were? What is truth? He wasn't interested in truth, just a philosophical observation. What is truth? After all. Anybody think that in hell Pilate isn't thinking now I know what truth was. 
Now I'm sure what truth was all about. I'm going to tell you something. If he could go back and do that all, that all over again, don't you think he'd figure out some way to get himself completely clear of that? I'm going to tell you a sad reality. There ain't no do-overs in hell. And once your course is set, chances are real tough for you to change them. And God might deliver you. And you might be a saved person. You might be a Christian. And you might be in a situation that, man, it just looks like my whole life is coming apart. It looks like I'm going to be smashed up on the seas and on the waves. But I want you to know something. Jesus said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. You and I are going to go home. And whether it's on bits and pieces of a busted up ship, whether it's by the grace of God we go there in flowery beds of ease, or whether we just go out there sitting in church or standing on a street corner and get run over by a dump truck, whether you get killed by a Muslim evangelist, however you go, you're going to be where Jesus is because he said, where I am there, you may be also. You know why I know that? Because God, whom I serve, told me that. It's in his book. Well, if he shows me something, maybe I'll believe that. Maybe you better believe it before you find out it's so and you can't change direction. You only got so many days in life. I don't know how many you got. You might have thousands of them left. Then again, you might have one. Uh, we stand on that street corner down there and people go walking by and, oh, I'm good. I don't know what that means. I believe what you believe. They don't know what I believe, but they, I believe what you believe. I don't know what they believe. All I know is, is this. Today you got a chance to do something that maybe changed the direction of your life. Maybe it'd bring you closer to the Lord than you've ever been. Maybe it'll start a whole new direction in life. A whole new sense of purpose. Because you know what? When you go from believing the wrong things to believing the right things, you get really good results. Let's believe the right stuff. That's what's in that book. Let's stand. Number 159. Need to talk to the Lord this morning. Come on ahead. These look like stairs, but it's actually an altar. You can kneel down there and talk to the Lord there. If you're saved, need something, ask the Lord about it. Need some direction, some help. Wasn't reluctant to answer Paul's, uh, Paul's needs. 159, Jesus, I come. Some people are bound up in their own indecision, their own undetermined end. The truth of the matter is, Without Jesus, the Bible says you can do nothing. Oh, I'll pray, try and do lots of things. Yeah, but you won't do anything that amounts to anything. Nothing that matters. 159, as we sing, Lord dealt with you about something, you deal with him about it.